Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to 2023. You've been here for a while, but uh, this is our first seminar uh, of the spring semester. Um, so uh, today uh, we have Professor Angela Krieger from the Department of History joining us. Um, uh, Professor Krieger is uh, trained as a chemist, correct? A biochemist? A biochemist, and then did the very natural uh, career transition to also study history, uh, which actually uh, plays her in a, in a really great position to speak to us at HMEI uh, in, in our sort of desire to uh, work in interdisciplinary ways. Um, she can do that single-handedly. Uh, most of us have to bring in other people. Uh, and today we're going to hear about uh, chemicals in the environment, um, and, um, and so very excited to hear this. Thank you. Okay. Hopefully you can hear me okay. Um, I want to thank Gabe uh, and Kathy Hackett and my friend Allison Carruth for the warm welcome at HMEI and Raj and Hans and Steve for helping me get set up here. Um, I'm recovering from a broken foot, so if at any point I sit down, it doesn't mean I'm about to faint. It's just, uh, yeah, I might need to sit for quite a bit. But um, I'm going to try it standing. So today, I'm really pleased to be able to present, let me see, here we go, a chapter out of a book that I'm writing entitled something like Mutations and Cancer Risk, A History of the Ames Test in Science and Regulation. How many people have ever heard of the Ames Test? A number of you. OK, don't worry if you haven't. I'll explain it. Uh, this particular chapter, called Chemical Passports, examines inter international efforts to establish environmental safety standards for chemicals, which relied on the submission and sharing of toxicity data. As the title suggests, this is a story about the mobility and fixity of different things. Um, some international agencies and regulators wanted legal regimes, standards, and chemicals to move freely in support of global capitalism even as they struggled with industry on the flow of information with their goods. And I really like this quote, which gave me the inspiration for this chapter from a policy person in 1980 talking about developments and how this might lead to chemical passports for trade and industrial chemicals. And the whole thing was predicated on the fact that there could be more extensive sharing of information. Now, this goal of a chemical passport, which was a set of identification and test data oops, that um, would be required for commercial chemicals to be freely traded actually didn't materialize. So I'm going to tell you a story of failure today. And in large part, this was due to the um, decision of the US that they didn't want to cooperate in this kind of adventure, in part due to pressure from US industry, but not only US industry. So chemicals continued and continue to move in massive quantities through global production and trade. But the movement of information about chemicals, especially toxicity data, remains highly circumscribed. Along with mobility is the issue of transparency. The information that's used by government agencies to make decisions about the safety of chemicals is not generally available to the public. And this is even true in sectors like pharmaceuticals, which are highly regulated, and the burden of proof is on industry to show safety data. So um, my, the same laws that protect consumers from hazardous chemicals often also protect industry data from being shared with consumers. So my story illustrates the tension between economic assumptions that markets work because information is freely available and the regulatory realities that access to chemical information is actually usually very limited. Now, activists and consumers took up the informational mantle as well. In the 1970s and 80s, environmentalists began to use right-to-know tactics in the struggle for more stringent regulation of toxic chemicals, which resulted in some concessions, but toxicity data for most chemicals, including high-volume chemicals, is generally not available. And my talk will consist of five parts. I've shortened this purple part uh, because of um, time constraints. But I'll start with some background information, talk about how the US was responding to new concerns about chemical safety. Then I'll shift to the level of international governance, which is where this chapter uh, is situated, and talk about the OECD's uh, chemical switchboard as um, one example of that. So let's start with some background. The kind of regulation that I'll be discussing was prompted by demands that the government protect people from new cancer-causing chemicals 
in pollutants, consumer products, foods, and drugs. But how does one actually determine which chemicals are the dangerous ones? As you can imagine, it's unethical to perform um, experiments on human beings. So in general, toxicologists rely on laboratory animals and kind of regimented tests that give certain toxicity endpoints. Um, the, the standardized tests that toxicologists have developed, and I'll focus especially on the rodent test for carcinogenicity, occupy a central place in generating the evidence for regulatory decision making. Now, toxicology, of course, is not the only sphere in which standardized testing plays a central role in decision making. Whether, whether it's nuclear weapons, education, automobile safety, or medical diagnosis, testing is a critical form of modern assessment and governance. And I follow the AIMS test and the data it produced through laboratories, companies, government agencies, and international bodies to see how toxicity data was operating in this period. Um, so let me sketch in a little bit of historical background, some of which will be no doubt familiar. In 1962, Rachel Carson's Silent Spring focused on concerns on the dangers of agents such as DDT and synthetic chemicals in industrial pollution, what she termed so memorably the elixirs of death to humans and wildlife. Historians have documented how the impact of this one book drew on several other developments, such as debates over radioactive fallout, the pollution of rivers and landscapes with noxious industrial waste, and the loss of native plants and animals due to suburbanization as well as environmental contamination. These debates were taking place not only in the US, but also around the world as epitomized by the United Nations Conference on the Human Environment, which was held in Stockholm in 1972. Concerns about the roles of food additives, pesticides, and pollution in human cancer inspired many scientists to apply new molecular understandings of health and disease to the problem. So take Berkeley biochemist Bruce Ames. As he recalls, sometime in 1964, I read the list of ingredients on a box of potato chips and began to wonder whether preservatives and other chemicals could cause genetic damage to humans. Now, he happened to have the material at hand to see if he could detect mutation-causing chemicals in bacteria. This is because he and a collaborator, Philip Hartman, had assembled thousands of mutations in the histidine biosynthetic pathway, which is depicted here. And what they did was to map these mutations for histidine prototrophy and determined which ones fell in each one of these, um, along each one of these specific steps in which a protein was encoded by a gene that was mutated. And the idea here is you can use mutations to actually make this in, um, intermediary map because when you get a blockage in one point of the pathway, then the intermediate accumulates and then you also know that the problem is in the gene for that protein. And Bruce Ames was using this set of mutants to look in ever more precise ways at the precise mutations that were disabling each of these enzymes, like exactly what base change was it? Was it an insertion mutant? That kind of thing. And he realized he could use this set of mutants to screen unknown substances to see if they cause mutation. And the test Oops, the test goes like this. He takes the strain of Salmonella typhimerium, which is this, you know, it's, we know sal Salmonella often as a pathogen. It also, this particular strain was one of the best genetically characterized organisms, especially bacteria, in the 1950s and 60s, which is why he was using it. That's why there were all of these mutants. So you take the strain and you put it on a Petri dish and you add rat liver extract. That's kind of the secret ingredient to this test. Because when our bodies encounter toxic substances, it's not necessarily the starting substance that poisons us. Sometimes that substance goes to our liver, which has a lot of metabolic machinery to detoxify things. And especially for synthetic substances, which our evolutionary history hasn't encountered before, those um, enzymes may actually generate carcinogenic substances in attempting to detoxify them. So it was already known that, in fact, many carcinogens are turned into carcinogens in the animal body. So this test helps to catch that by putting this rat liver extract in. This is the control plate, and you see each one of these red dots is a colony of cells, and that represents a spontaneous mutation that has restored function to that mutated gene, enabling that, um, those cells to now produce their own histidine and grow on minimal media again. 
And here you see a possible mutagenic substance has been added to this, and the salmonella then plated. There's many more colonies on this plate, and that means that this substance is actually inducing mutations. It's a very simple test. It can basically be done overnight, and he had several different strains which were, could be used to detect different kinds of mutations. So extremely sensitive, quick, and cheap. So this test relies on two basic assumptions to the degree that it's used to identify cancer-causing substances. The first is that human cancer is basically caused by environmental mutagens, that a carcinogen is always a mutagen. This isn't 100% true, but the dominant theory of carcinogenesis from that era, which is still the framework we um, usually explain cancer with today, namely that of somatic mutation, um, you know, within that framework, this was not a bad assumption. And secondly, a bacterium, in this case Salmonella typhimurium, is a good model organism with which to detect mutagens for humans. And this was, of course, justified on the fact that DNA is universal in all life forms. As he said, this may seem absurd to extrapolate from bacteria to humans, but it's logical to believe that mutagens for higher organisms are mutagens for bacteria also. And you don't need to worry about this diagram, but it just shows several um, of the most likely forms of DNA damage. So, within a few years, Ames's lab had shown how their new test could detect substances that cause or might cause human cancer, such as cigarette smoke, an industrial chemical, a chloroacetaldehyde, a food preservative, and a flame retardant, Tris. The US and Japanese governments made regulatory decisions based on Ames's test, uh, the results they got, as well as follow-up animal tests. And so this really showed the regulatory power of this kind of test, which could be done you know, overnight, as opposed to setting up a rodent test, which would take two years. And this was the issue, is that in fact there was a tremendous bottleneck in the testing of chemicals for carcinogenicity and other kinds of long-term chronic damage. This is because the rodent tests that were available, um, you basically um, expose a two, two species of rodents over two years at half the maximally tolerated dose. And to, to set that up and to analyze the results could cost a quarter of a million dollars, even in 1970s uh, terms. And the US government was trying to test chemicals at the National Cancer Institute and the National Tox Toxicology Program, but they could only do about 100 tests a year. Even the um, program for selecting the candidate chem chemicals for screening was time consuming and difficult. And by contrast, Ames's lab was able to do 300 chemicals in almost no time and found an 80% validation rate for these known chemical carcinogens in his tests. So this test could really potentially be done on all commercial or new chemicals. And as it turns out, Congress was debating a bill when Ames um, published his test. It was under debate from 1971 to 1975. It's called the Toxic Substances Control Act. And this was um, aimed at regulating chemicals whose effects, especially cancer, birth defects, and heritable mutations, resulted from long-term and chronic exposure. Exposure. This is exactly the kind of damage, damage to DNA, that the Ames test was designed to detect. Um, in 1975, there was a, a scandal over a ketone poisoning in a factory, and Gerald Ford said, we have to pass this bill, which has been basically stalled in Congress for five years. And of course, it then um, went through an intensive process of revision and negotiation the bill that resulted from those negotiations and was signed into law was substantially weakened compared to the bills that had been um, debated earlier because industry representatives had had such a key role in rewriting the text. And um, in fact, um, yeah, one of the, um, uh, these are the kinds of phrases that uh, you see in the literature about this, um, uh, about this law. I like it being, uh, it being called a torture to read because it's such a difficult statute. It's full of inconsistent phrases and self-references. And the word test is all over it, but when you really look at the requirements, it's a way to avoid testing for industry. So um, the TSCA actually also required EPA to publish health and safety information on chemicals. However, the agency was also required to protect proprietary information. And so companies routinely invoked confidentiality to prevent health and environmental data from being made public. 
And so to protect businesses, the EPA would use generic names in the things that they um, published, but then that made it possible for anyone in the public interested in these substances to figure out what the chemical was. So basically, the public data wasn't very useful. So this is really about the politics of information. The other side of testing is data, and controlling access limits potential actions by the public or the state. Um, and this is also at the moment when information technologies were becoming available that might have allowed for greater dissemination. And this is probably part of why industry fought so hard to restrict the flow of information about chemical toxicity. Now, the US was not the only country to enact new regulation of chemicals. Switzerland, Sweden, and Japan were also implementing new safety regulations for commercial chemicals. And the European community was updating its own directive. These new laws produced what are called non-tariff barriers to trade, which industry and certain international bodies do not like because they stand in the way of free trade if different countries have different regulatory requirements for imports of chemicals. Now, during the Cold War, the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development played a central role in the promotion of free trade as part of economic growth. During the Cold War, this idea was that capitalist democracy will only flourish if we can enable you know, free trade. Um, and the head of the EPA, Douglas Castle, was able to catalyze international action on chemicals regulation by getting Sweden to host a meeting of environmental ministers from 16 countries, as well as several representatives from international bodies, including the OECD and also some U UN um, organizations. Uh, he referred to this as, um, what did he call it, a uh, uh, shirt sleeve meeting at high level, because it wasn't an official meeting, um, and yet it enabled these environmental ministers to actually sort out how they could find a way towards some sorts of shared standards for environmental regulation. And at this meeting, it was decided that the OECD should take the lead on chemicals, and especially on harmonization of regulation. And it's worth mentioning the OECD was also extremely instrumental in this time in negotiating a resolution of the acid rain controversy, which pitted coal-burning Britain against northern Europe, which was dealing with you know, the um, acid rain from, um, from the emissions. So the OECD was, had been shown effective in dealing with environmental pollution and um, transboundary issues. Also, the chemical industry preferred that the OECD be the forum for this effort because its membership was restricted to industrialized countries. The UN, by contrast, represents the developing world as well. And so this is part of what political scientists call forum shopping. It's widely observed that different, um, you know, different actors will seek out fora which will give them what they want. And for uh, companies, that's often the OECD as opposed to other international bodies, because they tend to have a place for industry in their own negotiations. So just weeks after the meeting in Sweden, the OECD approved a three-year special program on the control of chemicals. They set up advisory groups for industry and labor, but not for public interest groups or environmental organizations. And so organizations such as the Environmental Defense Fund or um, um, the NDRC, the National Defense Regulator, uh, anyway, I can't remember the, the acronym, um, had toxicologists who were trying to participate in environmental policy, but there was no forum through which they could let their views be known at the OECD. Um, and industry not only could be on these advisory groups, but there were also industry scientists involved in the various expert groups. As you could see, they set up um, six different expert groups and the, each one would, had a different country who was organizing the efforts, although the, the participants of those groups were international. And for the mutagenicity test that I'm looking at, the AIMS test, there were two different groups that had the AIMS test as one of the tests they were looking at. The long-term toxicology groups, that would include looking at carcinogenicity, and the short-term toxicology group, um, which was also concerned about other effects of mutagenicity. And the fact that these two groups actually worked together and then had some of the same tests even in the five test areas they were looking at shows the difficulty of trying to disaggregate these tests into specific buckets because they often give information that may be relevant to more than one kind of environmental um, legal decision. So um, 
What I'll focus on now is the report coming out of these two groups. By 1981, the, um, and so that's, you can see the mutagenicity report here. Um, test guidelines were being issued as part of what the OECD was recommending that was called a minimum pre-marketing data set, or MPD. And the idea was that there would be a set of tests that we would be required for every chemical, and then that information would be available to all of the governments um, for import and export, and it would suffice for the kind of regulatory decision making that every nation um, had in place. And so mutagenicity was one of the toxicology tests that would be included in this MPD. And here you see the salmonella type Miriam test that I've told you about. There's a very similar test in E. coli. So the idea is that one of these two tests would be done on a chemical, and then one of these three other tests, which would look at DNA damage at a chromosome level cytogenetically. Now, when the Council on European Communities adopted their Sixth Amendment Directive in 1979, this increased the urgency of harmonizing testing requirements. And at the same time, the EPA realized that this proposed MPD would be really useful because they were having trouble um, getting test requirements through uh, implementation of TSCA. <coughs> so in the end, the MPD that the OECD proposed involved 34 different kinds of information. It included very simple things like physical and chemical characteristics, structure, boiling point, things like that. But it also included um, results from many different specified tests for chronic and ac acute effects as well as ecotoxicity, so the toxicity to um, um, wildlife and uh, the environment. So conducting the MPD for a new chemical was estimated to cost between thirty and eighty thousand dollars in um, around 1980, which was a lot of money, but not as much as doing one of those animal carcinogenicity tests in the laboratory rodents that I told you about. So that really made use of these new short-term and often in vitro tests as shortcuts to provide information for regulatory decision making. Now, um, when Reagan was elected and then appointed Anne Gorsuch as administrator of the EPA, the US's stance toward the MPD changed dramatically. In preparation for the high-level meeting where the OECD's proposals were going to be voted on, Anne Gorsuch requested a one-word addition in the draft decision of the council concerning the minimum pre-marketing set of data in the assessment of chemicals. So rather than saying that the MPD, quote, serve as the basis for a meaningful first assessment of the potential hazard of a chemical to health in the environment, end quote, the amended text would read, can serve making the MPD effectively voluntary for all OECD countries. As recorded in an OECD report, Gorsuch stated that, quote, she recognized the validity of MPD as one approach in certain geopolitical circumstances, but it was not the approach that had been taken by the United States, end quote. This one word edit had significant ramifications um, both for international trade, because the MPD would not be a required chemical passport, so to speak, but also for the EPA, which was really hoping that um, the agreement to the MPD would give the EPA the data they so desperately wanted for their own decision making for chemicals in the US. This effectively sealed industry's victory to prevent test requirements and the long struggle over TSCA's implementation. So in the mid-1980s, the OECD shifted its focus from harmonization to toxics management. They focused on three issues, testing of existing chemicals, because in many cases these new laws um, did not have requirements for things that were already on the market but only pertained to new chemicals, so there's many gaps in knowledge. Secondly, guidelines on information that should accompany chemical exports. And third, how to improve the flow of information about chemicals between OECD member countries. So lacking a passport system then, how might information, um, including about hazards, be conveyed across national borders? Now the OECD had a precedent for um, information exchange, namely their complementary information exchange procedure that in the past decade had enabled countries to share proposed and enacted chemicals regulation with each other. Um, 
And so officials at EPA suggested maybe something similar, but a little bit more complicated could be built for information about chemical toxicity and other, um, other uh, chemical information. They suggested what they called a switchboard program that would enable exchange of unpublished information among OECD member countries. Now, each country would appoint what's called a national focal point to organize a network of, quote, information holders in their country. And then these national focal points, they could be government agencies, but they didn't have to be. Industry, academic centers, or research institutes could all serve in this role, because the reality is that for chemical information, much of the information was not necessarily in government agencies, but might reside in companies or in other kinds of laboratory settings. But to know who held a specific piece of information, these national focal points would rely on reference points, organizations who would know how to make connections to sources of data. And presumably, these might be industry trade groups, for example. Each national focal point out would outline the procedures in a so-called national implementation plan to be submitted to the OECD. And I've tried, based on um, reading the OECD's archives, to reconstruct what this would work like. Um, but this is my own diagram, not theirs. So if you have kind of three different countries and someone wants a piece of information, the first step would be the initiation of a request from this data seeker to this national focal point. The national focal point would then convey this request to national focal points in other countries. And then hopefully a national focal point would know the relevant data holder to refer the request to. And last but not least, that data holder could then convey that information to the original data seeker. So you can see this is a somewhat um, complicated process relying on the cooperation of many different bodies. It actually does nothing to challenge the balance of power around information. The data, holders in, uh, the data holders in each case are probably in industry, so it doesn't actually move any information into the public domain or into agencies. But it did supposedly allow for information to move. So from the outset, industry opposed the switchboard idea. Industry certainly didn't want the OECD to, quote, impose mandatory information exchange schemes. Um, and even with the decentralized network, uh, representatives of industry were very critical. And here you see a quote. This is um, um, a note for, on, sent from the Office of Industry Association. So this is feeding information from that industry advisory group into the OECC decisions. You know, these people from the Business and Industry Advisory Committee stress that, that they have an informal referral network and they're satisfied with it. They said industry would have no reason to be a user and would rather not be burdened with multiple requests the Swiss industry felt especially strongly. So the switchboard's unwieldiness made rapid dissemination of information unlikely, and I haven't been able to find any information about it after the pilot prom program, which was set up in 1984. Now, the OECD was not the only international organization that was addressing these issues. The UN Environmental Program, UNEP, which was established as a result of the 1972 Stockholm Conference that I mentioned at the beginning, became the first forum in which developing countries could register complaints about the frequent absence of health and safety da of data provided with the chemicals they bought from industrialized countries. The agrochemical industry was more and more looking to the developing world as a market for pesticides that were becoming banned in industrialized countries. And in response, the UNEP established an international register of potentially toxic chemicals to serve as, quote, a global early warning system of undesirable environmental side effects, end quote. So this was to be the chemical arm of Earthwatch, which you may or may not be aware of. It was a set of three environmental data monitoring programs that were set up by the UNEP in the 1980s. However, the IRPTC would not actively notify countries of hazards, but instead simply serve as a referral system for information. Industry, though, was unwilling to share data. And this limited the viability of this information source. As the Business and Industry Advisory Committee of the OECD stated in um, 1982, unpublished proprietary data will likely will be submitted and shared with national authorities according to national laws and regulation. However, 
there is every indication that the chemical industry will refuse to submit data reports to any supranational organization. Now, this issue of access to information about potentially hazardous, hazardous chemicals also became a point of contention at the UNEP's governing council between industrialized countries and the developing world. Dr. Kanyo Kiandi, Kenya's Minister for Water Development, was quoted in a newspaper as saying, quote, Kenya detests the use of developing countries as experimental or dumping grounds for chemical products that have been banned or not adequately tested, end quote. Kenya subsequently proposed at the UNEP Governing Council that, quote, untested and unapproved commodities are not exported without the express consent of the appropriate government authorities in the recipient countries. After some north-south debate, as historian Mark Palomarts has put it, a slightly modified version was adopted, which, um, which retained what became known as the principle as a prior informed consent. And I'm very interested in the use of this term because this is the time in which human consent was becoming really important in human subjects research. So it's an interesting appropriation of informed consent into international environmental law. Although the consent was then replaced with notification. So let me draw some conclusions. Scholars of international environmental law have long discussed the ways in which countries or organizations seeking certain policies exhibit forum shopping, working with the international agency most likely to produce the desired outcome. So for example, the UN for developing countries or the OECD for industrialized ones. Regulation of commercial chemicals fits this pattern, not only with respect to countries, but specific national agencies in the private sector as well. In the waning days of the Carter administration, as industry was winning its legal battles to prevent EPA from requiring specific testing for chemicals under TSCA, the EPA administrators encouraged the OECD to take up the possibility of a base level test set in the context of harmonization. Industry then changed tactics into this international realm to prevent the OECD from adopting the EP, EPD, um, of course helped by the election of Ronald Reagan. The OECD's ongoing efforts to facilitate the movement of chemical information were also stymied. Chemical test data was precious, and both government agencies and trade associations were working in multiple arenas, national and international, to access or safeguard it. The metaphor of a forum suggests a large arena with a smooth surface on which actors can test with one another, yet the legal battles over chemical information reveal the jagged gaps and overlaps in the jurisdictional landscape of global governance. Debates over confidential business information and right-to-know initiatives by environmental groups were two sides of the same coin. The new currency was data. Was chemical information proprietary or public, a commodity or a right? Over the course of the 1980s, the status of data was changing, both due to new technologies of sharing it and the rapid expansion of international, excuse me, intellectual property law. So industry drew on new claims that knowledge, even, even simple testing data, had commercial value and thus should not be exchanged freely. And I'm struck by the similarity to debates at the same time over the status of genetic information coming out of the Human Genome Project. Was a sequence of letters going to be patentable or not? I mean, information, including also copyright and software, really posed new challenges to intellectual property law. Of course, economists imagine free markets functioning efficiently because rational actors have equal access to information. But as legal scholar Mary Linden notes, ignorance of toxicity may be an advantage to a product. Industry general want, generally wants to keep toxicity data out of circulation, even while they trade massive volumes of commercial chemicals around the globe. Anthropologist Kim Fortune has argued that making the, the environment informational has opened up new venues for citizens to contest regulation of toxics. However, it simultaneously expanded the legal grounds on which the chemical industry could maintain its control over the health and safety data of its products. Thank you. OK, well, thank you. Um, so now we'd like to open up for questions. For those of you on Zoom, uh, if you type in your questions in the chat, I'll relay them. And um, so, Catherine, I'm going to note that you have a question. And what I would invite is hopefully a student has a question. <laughs> 
Don't make me call on you. No question. All right. Yes. We'll get, we'll get the mic to you because this is going on Zoom. Sorry. Um, this was really fascinating. I'm wondering how um, the sort of regulations and industry and the, the methods for testing um, may have spilled over into like um, medical fields for the testing of humans and also environmental testing and testing of animals. And um, yeah, if you could just sort of elaborate on those intersections with some of your other work, it'd be great. So that's a really great question. I should say that um, I'm looking mostly at the commercial chemicals regulation under TSCA and then the counterpart at the international level. The regulation of some chemicals is really different, and pharmaceuticals is a great example. The pharmaceutical industry adopt the AIMS test immediately. They still use the AIMS test and its successors to this day, and it's a test done very early in candidate drugs. Anything that tests positive, unless it's a chemotherapy agent, is unlikely to be developed as a drug. So depending on what the legal incentives are, sometimes there's extensive testing. And then in other cases, I mean, I've argued that Tosca actually created disincentives for testing, which is really discouraging. So I think that the adoption of testing was different depending on the sector and the legal requirements if it was a commercial activity. Interestingly, there were also attempts to use the AIMS test to look at environmental samples. Um, because with the AIMS test, you don't have to have a pure chemical. You can have a mixture. I mean, the cells are just going to be exposed to whatever is in the sample you put in. So um, uh, that, in the end, that never really got off the ground. But it's definitely part of a moment of greater environmental sampling at this time. Most of the sampling that's done is more in the analytical chemical you know, a mindset where you're looking for very specific contaminants. And what was interesting about the Ames test is you could look for you know, mixture or just what is out there. But it, it becomes really hard to figure out how to regulate mixtures. But there definitely were some efforts along those lines. Catherine, we, we'll get the mic to you. Thank you so much for your talk. Around 20 years ago, I started to hear about methods for estimating toxicity and carcinogenicity based purely on computational approaches, theoretical um, approaches based just on molecular structure. And so what's the status of that? So no testing at all. This is a really great question. That is what the EPA developed when all of this failed because they still had to make decisions about regulation, and they didn't usually have data, including on new chemicals. It was very rare. Less than 20% of the kind of pre-manufacturing notifications that industry was filing would have the kind of data that the EPA needed to know whether to permit it to go forward or request greater testing. So it's a great example of a regulatory, of innovation in a regulatory agency. And there's a very nice paper on this by Henry Boulier, David Dumartin, and Maurice Zeman. Maurice Zeman was actually someone who was working in the toxic substances branch of the EPA at this time. So he was a participant in this. And it's called Structure Activity Relationships. It was done initially just by comparison, and then it was, uh, com you know, uh, you, then it became computerized. And it still is really important. Ironically, of course, that was picked up to, to great effect in the drug industry. I mean, it's used much more widely than just looking at contaminants. My own sense is that it's still probably not as valuable as actually having the data on a specific chemical. But um, yeah, that was exactly what the EPA turned to when they just couldn't get data. Rob? Yeah, wonderful talk. But you asked at the very beginning if people had heard of the Ames test, and I raised my hand. And then I proceeded to do a search in really back cells of my brain. Um, and I remember that his own, Bruce Ames' personal experience became one of the most talked about uh, aspects of the environmental movement. And if I have it right, he started testing natural products. Yes. And the natural products turned out to be carcinogens one after the other. And he said, we've got something wrong here isn't that we can't start taking things like peanut butter, and I think that, but I remember what the actual things were. I think that may have been one of them. So it had an, it had an effect. Certainly it 
it opened up sort of right-wing environmentalism. Yes. It was a kind of leader of it. Uh, so can you say more about that? Yes, this is something I've looked at quite closely. Mm, sure. And I have an article published on this, um, actually. I will say at the beginning, I'm doing a study of the Ames test and not a biography of Ames. He's a really complicated character because he actually became um, a libertarian over the course of the 1970s. He was very inspired by environmentalist ideas, as you can see in developing his test, very concerned about exposures and preservatives and that sort of thing. But over the course of the 1970s, he became convinced that uh, DNA damage was so ubiquitous that industrial regulation wouldn't make a difference in human cancer rates. Um, and in part, it's because his laboratory was studying not just um, the mutagenicity of a lot of natural substances, including a lot of foods. And for peanut butter, the danger isn't, isn't actually the peanut butter, but contaminating aflatoxin, which is the most potent known natural carcinogen in the world, I believe. Um, but also lots of other fruits and vegetables and beverages, like alcohol, uh, have um, mutagens in them. So, and it was increasingly recognized as well that human metabolism generates free radicals that do significant DNA damage too. So by just being alive, we experience DNA damage, and the older humans get, the, um, the more their DNA um, repair apparatus degrades, and this is part of why cancer is so heavily correlated with aging. So my book actually attends to both of these strands, the way in which politically this effort to use an available test that would resolve the bottleneck was kind of thwarted, and at the same time, the way in which cancer biology began to move on to other kinds of issues. And I would say most biologists now would really deplore Ames' own libertarianism and to some degree affiliation with more you know, right-wing organizations. I don't think he's a, a you know, climate change denier or anything like that. But industry loved to quote him about how our lives or our natural lives was, were full of mutagens uh, as a way to say we don't need to regulate um, synthetic things. Um, but yeah, I think in addition, the, the growing interest in the specific genes that are mutated that lead to human cancer, oncogenes and then tumor suppressor genes, shifted the, both the scientific and the public attention away from exposure and more towards predisposition. So what mutations have I already inherited from my family? And you know, to this day, most cancers are just mutations in somatic cells. They're not necessarily due to any kind of a familial pattern. I mean, we're bombarded all the time by things that contribute toward DNA damage. But what I saw in a, in a digital humanities project that um, I have a great group of students working on with me is that if you look in the scientific literature and PubMed and just the titles and abstracts, which is a huge you know, text corpus, um, in association with the word cancer, the frequency of the word um, mutagen goes down in this period, and the frequency of the word mutation goes up. So I think there's a shift away from exposure and towards the genetic. And Reid, we'll get you the mic. And then we have a question online, too. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much for a really interesting talk. So uh, I have a question that's kind of more in historical context, but I want to share my own uh, crazy Bruce Ames story, which I think I've told you. So he guest lectured in um, toxicology class I took in graduate school at Berkeley and just came in and sort of undid everything that we learned the entire course and said things like, well, DDTs never hurt anybody. Um, in fact, it's probably better for, you know, because it provides better fruits and vegetables to, you know, it was this really crazy, just like range of, um, you know, very uh, controversial ideas. Um, anyway, that's not my question. My question is in a historical context, like after a decade, after, you know, sort of this erosion of um, environmental um, chemical information, we hit the Superfund period, right? So it was, you know, real uh, legacy of, lingering legacy of environmental contamination that's still kind of present today to, to a small extent. And so I'm really curious um, how much the sort of the Reagan's undoing or sort of the political undoing of some of these um, environmental regulations and, and environmental data had to do with the kind of the big Superfund calamity that, that came a decade later. It's a big question. It's one that's hard to answer. I will, first of all, draw attention to the fact that I'm pretty sure the same piece of legislation that established the Superfund sites also established the toxic substances inventory or something like that. 
in which the EPA finally began mandating that emissions, um, that in areas where there are emissions, that consumers should be able to find out about them. So um, that very bill really signals the kind of right, I mean, that was seen as a, a real um, advance in right to know, even though it's only a small fraction of exposures in our everyday life. Um, I mean, in some ways you're asking a counterfactual in that um, one can wonder if Reagan hadn't been elected, whether the implementation with Tosca would have been stronger in the US and the OECD would have been able to pass its MPD. And that would have enabled greater flow of chemical information, at least among industrialized countries. It is certainly possible, but looking in the Carter administration when Tosca was being implemented, industry found plenty of ways to thwart the effective implementation, and I don't have any doubts if Carter had been reelected that they would have been able to continue that. I mean, the, the weakness of Tosca as a law really became um, exemplified in the ruling about benzene. I'm trying to remember the name of the case, but basically the EPA tried to ban benzene, and companies you know, that produce no, it wasn't benzene, I'm sorry, it's asbestos. Benzene is another really, really important case. Companies that tried that produce asbestos were able to success, successfully challenge the law in the Court of Appeals, and then because it was under the Reagan administration, they refused to appeal it on behalf of the EPA to the Supreme Court. And because there were 12,000 pages of documentation of the carcinogenicity of asbestos, the kind of common understanding is that if the EPA couldn't ban asbestos under Tosca, they could never ban anything. And EPA basically stopped trying. The story, there's a legal scholar at Michigan who's saying the story is actually a little bit more complicated and the EPA missed certain key things that would have helped them uh, do better in that case. But it's also true that the government began moving away from rule-based regulation toward voluntary regulation. And that what we see now is a lot of important decisions that are being made around toxic chemicals are happening directly between environmental groups and industry and not through the EPA. I don't know how I feel about that because those kinds of agreements like getting PFAS out of textiles and that sort of thing, you know, these aren't based in law. They could be reversed as easily as they're made. They're being done for public opinion, not for, you know, um, you know for the long-term environmental safety. But the other thing is that um, the European Union passed REACH uh, it's an acronym, it's a registration, evaluation, and authorization of chemicals and something. And the implementation, and that is a more precautionary law, which requires test data for high volume chemicals. And scholars working in Europe have been extremely disappointed with how it's been implemented, in effect kind of being, um, you know, crippled, I mean, un, I mean, kind of defanged of its strength. So I think we live in a world in which non-state actors, including corporations, have a lot of say, and it's not so clear to me that international environmental law um, is the best way forward. That said, I, I mean, reading through the OECD archives, it was just like, I can't, this is incredible. So, and also the idea, I think the OECD was also somewhat naive in thinking they could get these programs to work. Um, anyway, what would have been, I don't know. So we have two questions online that I'm going to merge, uh, well, say back to back. Uh, first, we, uh, we have a, a request of what could one read to learn more about the second half of the talk, the, the role of the OECD in the UN? And then the first question asks, um, does the potential liability uh, under environmental laws uh, modify, motivate industry to engage more in toxicity testing and release of data? Uh, before. These are really, really good questions. I think the best thing on the second part of my talk is Mark Palomart's um, book. I can certainly send the reference if this person reaches out to me. Um, I'm happy to email you the reference. There's a, a book on uh, international regulation of toxics that's really, really good. Um, and the second question remind me. Uh, the potential liability under yeah, environmental so laws. The, for many parts of the chemical industry, what they sell are not consumer products, but intermediates, in which the consumers are actually other sectors, uh, makers of agrochemicals, or the electronics industry, or, I mean, 
chemicals are in basically every sector of society, and chemical companies often are providing you know, the starting materials for lots and lots and lots of other consumer uh, products that ultimately end up with consumers. So liability issues then become really complicated because it's often the companies that sell to the consumers that are liable rather than the companies that make the starting materials. Um, I think the area in which liability has been really effective in terms of toxicity uh, testing is uh, consumer is like just direct consumer products. Like I talked to a toxicologist at Procter and Gamble, and he's like, "We absolutely do all this testing, and we have you know the things about our products you know available to consumers." And so I do think that where companies are identifiable by name, the brand you know the strength of a brand name is really important, and that provides a very strong incentive for those companies to, to try to present information that will persuade consumers their products are useful. But the kinds of transactions and, and trade that happens in the chemical industry more widely, I think, makes it really difficult for um, consumer expectations to, uh, to help. Dan? So as I, I look at your last bullet here. Yeah. Um, industry works systematically to block public release or dissemination of chemical information that would enable consumers and markets to make informed choices. Is there anything that's not added to our food or to the air we breathe that isn't going to be a mutagen? Yeah, not everything's a mutagen. But most. A lot of things are. are. So would a consumer be able to make an informed choice if virtually so everything wrong. that would be in a product is going to be a mutagen? Um, I mean, part of why I wrote that is that I think that um, our ideas about uh, you know, neoliberal regulation rely on information being available. I can, you know, economist models often assume information is available and that that's how rational actors can make good decisions. And I mean, part of what my talk is trying to show is that that assumption is not right. Um, but the I cynic, mean, the cynic in no me. There's no way you can avoid encountering mutagens in your daily life. That is absolutely true. I do think that man-made mutagens often um, are more persistent than uh, natural mutagens. So not all mutagens are the same. In addition, just because something is mutagenic doesn't mean that it's going to be a potent carcinogen. This is where getting into the exactly so between dosages and things like that. Carcinogenicity is really important. And Bruce Ames was really, really critical of animal tests. That really helped, you know, endear him to toxicologists too, right? Because he felt like all these animal tests, which are giving high levels of chemicals to animals, don't tell us anything. Um, the problem is that once you, there are questions about every test. And I'm going to have a whole chapter in the book on validation issues for the Ames test. But like animal tests aren't really rigorously validated. What do you validate them against, right? Human cancer rates? I mean, it's very hard. So ultimately, I think, you know, we have to, we as a society have to make choices about how we're going to regulate, how we're going to inform. I don't, we can't live in an uncontaminated and non mutagenic world. And I don't want to in any way give the illusion um, of that. And I, yeah. And yet, I mean, the reason I ask the question is, yeah. on our food products, we have calories, we have fat, we have sodium. <laughs> so that information has been allowed on our products, and yeah. we use that information to make decisions. This is overwhelming, and yeah. the information doesn't get into people's ken. They don't use it because most things are bad to some level, right? I mean, I think there's two other considerations that underline your point. Um, one is that... People are so scared of cancer that they often don't really think about the other kinds of health effects from exposures that are bad, especially like neurotoxicity. I mean, a lot of pesticides are not necessarily very carcinogenic, but they kill by being neurotoxins. So I think sometimes we overweight cancer and don't think about the other kinds of risks that we encounter in our everyday life. Um, and what was the other thing I was going to say? I can't remember. Oh, well, I know what it is. Um, the somatic mutation theory for cancer is still, um, you know, our basic framework, but the development of an and concern in endocrine disruptors show that there are other mechanisms for cancer that mutagenicity testing won't catch. So, yeah, I mean, in that sense, it's, it's an impossible situation. 
but it's an impossible situation and a complicated scientific situation in which um, interested parties can use that to their advantage. Does that make sense? Yeah, and we did ban smoking, which was a, which was a mutagen, right? So, so Rio? Thank you, Angela. Um, this is my own bias, but when I was hearing your story, I kept thinking about the radiation exposure and how there are many perils that I can think of. And I think in this way, it made me really wonder about the, what might have happened through the process of standardization, harmonizations, you know, um, and the testing sort of mechanism to the idea of body. That is, like, is there any conversation surrounding this type of thing, trying to standardize body? Because as you know, one of the stuff happened in the radiation exposure was to come up with what they call reference man, right? To standardize to the white man's like body as the model of something being, you know, exposed. So I, I just wanted to hear whether or not this process, the politics surrounding the toxicology, kind of the put out the idea of what the body would mean. Now, I don't have a good answer for you in part because I'm looking at a test that was, I'm not looking at human exposures as much, but the, it hasn't escaped my, intention, my attention that interest in ionizing radiation provided like really the footprint or the interest in concern about and regulation, testing of and regulation of chemicals. I mean, there's a reason why it was called the Environmental Mutagen Society, and it was at Oak Ridge National Laboratory, because Alexander Hollander, having really led the group that did really important work in DNA damage from radiation, realized that this was analogous to chemicals. So that connection is absolutely there. The one area where they do share similarities, I will say, is that for some chemicals, like with radiation, Exposures at different points in the life, and the you know development and the lifespan can make a difference. So, um, but I don't have a good answer for whether there's a kind of a chemical body. I mean, all of us. The other thing is, I have written on human biomonitoring, and it's not as if we are pristine and the world is contaminated. We are also contaminated. Like we live in a world that's full of contaminants, and we carry within our bodies, whether it's DDT or PCBs or whatever, you know, parts per billion of. So I think part of what I've tried to do is to recalibrate my own notion of the integrity of the body to think more about the, the chemical, you know, chemical interactions that we have with our body. So, Laura, what will be our final question. Thank you. I wanted to iterate after Dan's point about your last bullet point and the fact that we should always think that we are making informed choices because everything is contaminated. But... I don't see how we can hope having any regulation. I mean, if I take for, I can't um, stop making the parallel with the recent uh, problem that came out where there was a lot of heavy metals in baby food. So even if, I mean, if we're not even able to regulate heavy metal in baby yeah. food, um, and you know, it's not a difficult test. It's, I mean, it's not even, yeah. you know, we're not even yeah. about talking about cancer or anything. Yeah. You know? So I don't know. I, I'm feeling very <laughs> hopeless right now. I, I, I feel pretty hopeless, too. <laughs> but I will say one of the things that your comment um, illustrates is that we tend to think that newer chemicals may be more dangerous. I mean, there's all kinds of new synthetics. There's nanomaterials and this and that. I'm not, I'm not saying they're safe, OK? But we tend to assume that things that have been in human society for a long time we've probably sorted out their hazards and they're well taken care of. And that is absolutely positively not true. Heavy metals, mercury, asbestos, you know, silica exposure. Um, there's all kinds of lead. There's all kinds of things that are really, really pressing chemical contamination and, and hazard issues that have been part of human society for hundreds of years. And yeah, they still aren't under control. And if anything, Often decisions have been made to just tolerate the public health costs of exposure, especially in the case of asbestos, rather than give up on the economic benefit. So, yeah, I'm not so I'm not I'm not so optimistic. Yeah. All right. <laughs> so, um, I'll, I'll uh, try to spin some optimism out of this, and and it is uh, I, I think. <laughs> 
uh, we are having this conversation. And uh, in fact, we're going to continue a related conversation in a month on March 7th. Uh, Professor Paul Cherick of the uh, Department of Chemistry is going to talk about reimagining the periodic table, sustainability challenges in the 21st century. And although our current position may not be one uh, that it necessarily inspires a lot of hope with regards to these chemicals, uh, perhaps the trajectory is one that we can, uh, through our contributions, through our engagement, through our communication, uh, impact and get to a uh, different position. So uh, let's not focus on our position and focus more on the momentum. And with that, uh, thank Angela again. Okay, thank you.